I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and their hospitality. And then happy, happy for the early spring. It's still very cold at home. This is nice. I want to start at the very beginning. Probably the first thing you learn when you start to learn algebraic geometry is that when you look at affine varieties, you have a variety. And you have its coordinate ring. And you learn very early on, there's this very nice relationship. The x and y are isomorphic, if and only if the rings are isomorphic. When you move to the projective case, this is no longer true. All right, so let's do a quick example. Let's take P1 in P1. And take the twisted cubic. In the first case, your homogeneous coordinate ring is, say, this. In the second case, you have four variables, let me call it. and see if I can get it right. <clears throat> this. So your homogeneous coordinate ring for P1 sort of in P1 and your homogeneous coordinate ring of the twisted cubic. So since this is sort of a grad student talk, can somebody tell me why these rings are not isomorphic? I'll say it's obvious they're not isomorphic, just for added pressure. So as a hint, I would say, look back at what you know in the affine case. In the affine case, you know that varieties are isomorphic if and only if the rings are isomorphic. So here we have two rings, and I'm claiming they're not isomorphic. Think about the varieties that these things correspond to. So in the first case, what is the affine variety corresponding to this ring? Somebody whispered it. <laughs> A2. So in the affine case, this is A2. What about this? This is a cone, a cone over the twisted cubic. This one is smooth, this one is not, so the ring is not isomorphic. Now, when you see this at first, you might be disappointed. Things work so nicely in the affine case. Now in the projective case, things hardly seem to work at all. You have this nice ring. Uh, but they don't seem to tell you a lot. In reality, the opposite is true. What this tells you is that this homogeneous coordinate ring carries a lot more information than the affine coordinate ring. The affine coordinate ring tells you nothing other than the variety you began with. The homogeneous coordinate ring clearly contains extra information. It certainly remembers the variety. But it knows a lot more. Right? The homogeneous coordinate ring or 
What else does the homogeneous coordinate ring know? What is the extra information? It knows the embedding. Good. And the embedding. In the outline case, the information about the embedding is lost. The ring doesn't carry that information. In the projective case, the ring remembers the embedding. So the question we want now, the question we want to ask is, a homogeneous coordinate ring comes this extra information, how do we get it out? It's nice to know it has the information, but we want it. Otherwise, it's not very helpful that it has the extra information. So how do we get this information out? And maybe more to the point, what sort of information can we get? So let me start with another example, similar example. Let's suppose we have a smooth smooth rational curve in P3. Smooth non-degenerate. to live in a plane. What is the degree of x? Are there any other possibilities? Someone take a guess. Yeah, we can. Any degree three or greater. Let's see if we can understand the difference between, say, degree three and degree four. So in the case of degree three, we have the homogeneous coordinate ring, which I wisely erased. Hopefully, you either remember it or you wrote it down. Let's think about the degree four case. How do you get a degree 4 rational curve in P3? There's essentially only one way. What you've done is you've taken P1 and you've embedded it into P4 as a rational normal curve of degree 4. And then you projected it down to P3. But this isn't any old projection, right? You've got your curve. How do we get from P4 to P3? Well, we took a point, and we projected. And we got this. What's the one thing we have to be careful of? sure that from this point P, every line through P only hits the curve in one point. If that line through P hits the curve in two points, those two points are going to get identified down here and we won't have a smooth curve. So we need to make sure it does not lie. on the secant line. The question is, can we do that? Well, let's think a minute. Let's consider a 
I don't have any better notation for now. We will in a little bit. Let's think of the set of all secant lines. We want to miss this set. Right? You want to make sure that there's some P that is not in that set. But you think just a minute, what would the dimension of this set be? We've got the set of all secant lines. What do we need to make a secant line? We need two points on our curve and the line between them. So two points on the curve, that's two dimensions. And then the line between them is a third dimension. So we expect, here's our guess, and this is a correct guess. But the dimension of the set of secant lines is 3. The dimension of our space is 4. So there's plenty of room to find a point to do this. Now, a little more to the story. Let me do it on the sideboard. For no other reason than it will be useful to us, instead of secant lines, What if we look at the set of three secant P2s? In other words, instead of things like this, a P2 that hits your curve in three points. You look at the set of all of those, what does the dimension of this look like? Well, it, five. So it looks like 5. You do the same count. A 3 secant P2, that's 3 points on your curve. 1, 2, 3, that's 3 dimensions. And then a P2 is 5 dimensions. Problem in this case is we're in P4. Um, so this is going to be 4. This will fill up our space. What this tells us is that this P, we found this nice P. It wasn't on the secant variety. We used it, project, used it to project our rational curve to get a rational curve of degree 4 in P3. However, P has to live on one of these. No matter what P you choose, it's living in one of these planes. What happens to this plane when you project from P? You get a P1 that these three points will now all live on a line. What this tells you is that this curve, so if x in P3 is a rational smooth, rational curve of degree 4, and x has what's called a tri-secant line. This is information about the embedding. This tells you that no matter how you try to put a smooth rational curve in P3 with degree 4, it has to have a tri-secant line. There's just got to be one. The fact that this dimension fell, that this dimension is nearly 5. 4 isn't close to 5 when it's dimension. Um, there's a line on a lot of these. There will be a lot of triseconds. Now let's think about what this tells us for the homogeneous coordinate ring. Since that was supposed to be our goal. Suppose you've got... in the ideal of x of degree 2. So you have a quadrant in the ideal. If your quadrant vanishes on x, Because those three points are on x, your quadrant vanishes at those three points. But 
But let's take a minute now. We have a quadric that vanishes 3.3 times on a line. What does that tell you? It must vanish on the whole line. Let me call this L. The Q has to vanish three points on that line. That tells you that Q vanishes on L. This should bother you a little bit because X doesn't have a line on it. X is a rational curve. There's no room for a line. What does this tell you about the homogeneous ideal? You have to have at least one cubic generator or higher. So this tells you that the ideal of this curve is not generated by cubics. that out, right? <laughs> Tells the ideal is not generated by quadrics. So in the case of the twisted cubic, our ideal was generated by quadrics. If we have something of degree 4, it's not generated by quadrics. If you have something of degree 5, you've got the same argument. You've got to start in P5, come all the way down to P3. You're always going to have a trisecant line. So we get this very nice and very simple characterization of the twisted cubic. So if x in P3 is a non-degenerate, smooth, rational curve, and x is the twisted cubic, If and only if, I'll point out, the fact that we know that the ideal of the twisted cubic is generated by quadrics means the twisted cubic has no trisecants. So if and only if x has no trisecants, which is true if and only if the ideal is generated by quadrics, And in fact, here, true if and only if this was the easy one, x is linearly normal. Linearly normal, of course, just means that it was not the projection from something from a higher dimension. OK, let me do one other quick example. sort of to the side. Over here, we ran into this tri-secant line, and we said that if we had some quadric in the ideal, quadric had to vanish three times on the line, and so it has to vanish on the line. Because x was a curve, the line, of course, is not on your curve. But in general, you might have lots of lines and still be generated by quadrants. And many means a lot, right? Through any point, you've got two. So there's lots and lots of lines here. So it certainly does happen We want to think about this a little bit. This relationship, 
not so much between the twisted cubic and these things, but say between tri-secants and being generated by quadrants. So if we try to extend this, this is sort of a nice easy example, and it's nice and easy because there are very few rational curves. If you give me a rational curve, I sort of know how it got there, right? We knew to get something in degree four, there's only one way to get it there. So we knew exactly what would happen with a degree four rational curve. But what happens when we move to higher genus? stick with curves for a little while. What if I said, well, let x be a smooth curve. Measured by line bundle L. I'll leave you a blank. So if degree of L is greater than or equal to something, then X has no tricycle lines. We don't want to have a situation where we have three points that span a line. We always want three points to span a plane. If you think, again, you, you've seen this before, right? What condition do you need for two points to always span a line? Here, a word for that. Properly, a subscheme of length two always spans a one-dimensional subspace. Correct. Correct. We call it very ample. Right, two points span a line. That's very ample. If your two points come together and span a point, that's not very ample. Two points spanning a line, that means it's very ample. It means you're always separating your points. Is how we usually say that. We don't want to separate points, we don't want to separate pairs, we want to separate triples. What do you need to separate pairs? What's your degree bound? <coughs> Here, whisper again. 2g plus 1. Mm -hmm. Right, so at 2g, what do you have at 2g? You have base point free. That sort of means that you always got your one point is always spanning a zero dimensional thing. You have no holes. 2g plus 1, pairs of points are spanning lines. So take a stab at what our bound should be. 2g plus 2. So, degree of line bounds at least 2g plus 2, that x has no tri-secant lines. And so that means that if you were going to look for some sort of bound, say, when is the ideal of a curve generated by quadrics? You've got to at least be this big. For genus 0, this is great. Degree 2, that's plain quadric. Degree 3, that works for genus 0. We know those. For genus 1, this already tells us a little something, right? For genus 1, we're going to get to degree 4. We knew that because degree 3 on genus 1, that's a plain cubic. That's clearly not generated by quadrics. So this is the first place you're going to get any sort of statement. Let me make a little chart. Degree. Geometric consequence <coughs> F 
an arithmetic consequence. By an arithmetic consequence, I mean, what does this tell us about the homogeneous coordinate ring? So our degree is 2g plus 1. And I have dates here, so I need my sheet. Our degree is 2g plus 1. The geometric consequence is that we get into bedding. The line level is very ample. How about our arithmetic consequence? Can you tell me anything you know about the homogeneous coordinate ring if you embed a curve by line bundle three at least 2g plus 1. This is an old, old result, essentially. Um, usually dated back, at least to begin with, with Castanovo. Probably means he didn't really prove it, but he knew it was true. Um, a little more recently, <coughs> 1970 is becoming very classical, I guess. So, almost 40 years ago. What is our arithmetic consequence here? We have projective normality or normal generation. I think that's the phrase Mumford used. At 2g plus 2, so this is our bound here that we're looking. We know that at 2g plus 2, we have no tri-secant. Anyone fathom a guess what happens at 2g plus 2? Hope for the best. Quadric generation. longer series of names attached to it. Um, I'll just put in a couple here. It's always a danger because someone will say, hey, what about somebody else? So same paper by Mumford. He didn't get the 2g plus 2. He was 3g plus 3, I think. Become a little more subtle. What's our geometric consequence of having 2g plus 3? We have no 4 secant p2s. How does that help us? Well, let's think about it. points, I've got three points. We choose coordinates here. <coughs> 3g 
three points in the plane, we have three quadric generators. Four points in the plane, we have four or two quadric generators. And let me point out something about these generators that you, I don't know, I would not have seen had someone not shown it to me. If you look here at these generators, x, y, x, z, and y, z. If I take z times q0 and say subtract y times q1, what do we get? Zero. If you like, you might think of this in terms of vectors. Either a matrix product or a dot product. This is called a linear syzygy. There's a linear relation among the generators of the three points. What happens here with a four secant two plane? I will leave it as an exercise to check that there is only really one syzygy here. Trivial syzygy. This is not linear. It's a quadratic syzygy. So what this is telling us, just like the tri-secant line, is that at 2g plus 3, we should hope not only for quadratic generation, but we should hope that all the syzygies among our quadrics are linear. And again, if it weren't true, I wouldn't be writing it on the board. It turns out to be true. Because more properly, all syzygies are generated by linear syzygies. And this is Mark Green in 1984. Now, this suggests that we should keep going. Keep turning up the degree. Keep having no whatever, whatever, p whatevers. And what will happen with our syzygies? Here we looked at our syzygies for relations among the equations. There are relations among the syzygies, which are also called syzygies. There are relations among the relations among the syzygies, which are also called syzygies. Can we make a definition? What are you going to say? L satisfies NP if say X is projectively normal, which is usually called N0. I of X is generated by quadrics. called N1. And finally, the syzygies are linear for P 
minus 1 stages. So for n1, that's linear for 0 stages. That just means we have quadrants. The theorem alluded to over here, or suggested over here, is that if x is a smooth curve, and the degree of L is at least 2g plus p plus 1, then L satisfies np. I'll come back to this in just a minute, just to give you some idea of what happens in general. So since this result, this property has been studied a lot for 25 years now, even a partial description of what is known would take up hours and hours. There's just too much out there. So just a couple high points. Um, Aside from Green's result in 1984, Ein and Lazarsfeld in 93 showed that if you take a variety of dimension D, and a very ample line bundle, then k plus l, p plus d plus 2 satisfies np. If you were able to drop the word very and replace it with simply ample, you would have precisely this result for curves. This is the best possible in some sense um, but there is an expectation you should be able to drop the word very. On the other hand, this result is now 16 years old, and we haven't been able to drop the word very yet. So, who knows? Somewhat more locally, and sort of in the same spirit as these pair of papers, Choi Kang Park, this is 2005 and 2006. Show essentially that if you have a line bundle that satisfies NP, then if you choose a point on your variety and you project, line bundle. This will satisfy NP plus 1. In the case of curves, of course, picking a point and projecting has precisely the effect of dropping the degree of the line bundle by 1. So this matches very nicely what we see here. I said I would come back to this. And the reason I want to come back to this is that this result, we can prove this. original proof, I wouldn't try to read it, um, it's hard, 
and our quicker ones now. Nick, there, I'll show you proof. Due to Lazarsfeld. So let me start with something I won't prove, but he is pretty standard by now. Take this nice reasonable condition. So it's HIXL is zero for I greater than or equal to one. Then L satisfies NP if and only if H1, X, and I'll define this object in just a second. <coughs> which A, M, L, tensor L to the K is zero. For k greater than or equal to 1, a between 1 and p e plus 1. Now, what is this? Well, we have our L. We are assuming that our degree here is pretty large. I guess we're going to assume really L is very ample. In any case, so L is globally generated. So gamma of L subjects onto L. There's a kernel. We can call it MF. Works just as well for any globally generated. So we've got this ML, and the condition we want to verify is this. We like this. We like vanishing conditions. We're good at this. How in the world would you get this thing to vanish? Well, much easier than you might think. Let's take a sequence of points. X1 to Xn on X distinct points. such that L minus these points is globally generated. And <coughs> H1 is 0. So we're not changing our H1. And we're still globally generated. Let's see what we've got. We would have L. We're going to restrict L. So for notation. Let this be D. We have this, which I should have written lower. Take global sections. We know that's subjective. We have assumed that this is subjective by our choice of points. This is subjective to D as much points. And this is subjective to the right because of our H1 condition. And so now, we essentially use the snake lemma. This is ML. This is M L minus D. And we have 
one more term to fill in. If you think about this a while, or maybe you do it when d is a single point, you'll be able to convince yourself that what this last term is, is a sum of O minus x i. And this sequence right here is all we need. So now let's use the hypothesis of our theorem. We're going to assume that the degree of L is at least 2G plus P plus 1. This says that our x is in Pn. How many points can we choose and have this condition hold? Well, we know here that n is at least, let me simplify. I'm going to take exactly 2g plus p plus 1 just because it's simpler. So if we take the degree to be 2g plus p plus 1, that way we have equalities, not inequalities. Where do we live? We have that in p g plus p plus 1. And I'm going to pick g plus p general points. And project from the p g plus p minus 1 expand. Well, if we do that, where are we mapping things? To P1, right? This is a co-dimension 2 hyperplane. This misses our curve. So we are now setting our curve to P1. If we're setting our curve to P1, let's think about what this left vertical sequence looks like. What is H0 L minus D? Well, this is sending us to P1. H0 of this is 2. We've only got two sections. And if we've only got two sections, what is the rank of this vector bundle? It's a line bundle. This has rank 2. This has rank 1. This has rank 1. So NL minus D is a line bundle. You know it's a line bundle. To draw these closer to each other. But if you look at this, this is trivial. Mm -hmm. So you know that this is the dual of this. So ML minus D is L dual D. Now, take that top sequence. moment, I will call this S. The top row now becomes 0 to L to D to ML to S. And so taking exterior powers, This tends to everything by L. And now just compute. Oh, P, P, P. I 
you change one or the other, but I meant P, yes. <laughs> you can edit that too. Okay. What is this? Well, S is the direct sum of minus a points. So take an exterior power. This is P plus one tuples of minus a point. So this whole thing is just a direct sum of line bundles. What is the degree? Well, it's the degree of L, which was 2G plus P plus 1, minus P plus 1, which is 2G. And so you have a bunch of line bundles of degree 2G. H1 of that is 0. Over here, you have the same thing. Here you have a line bundle. This is D. This is degree G plus P. This time I'm pulling off P of them. So this is the sum of line bundles of degree G. So if we choose these points to be general, we have a general line bundle of degree G and a general line bundle of degree G, a general effective line bundle of degree G, on a smooth curve as h1 equal to 0. And so this is it. This might be my favorite exact sequence. Certainly one of my favorite exact sequences. You've got to have a favorite, right? I like this one. It's very nice and clean. And you can get remarkable mileage out of it. <coughs> okay. Um, there are lots of conjectures for what happens when the degree is smaller. Maybe there's one big conjecture, but. There are also lots of results. Things get difficult as soon as you move below that threshold. In general, I would also like to point out um, this NP problem is still not understood for very easy embeddings of projective space. This is a, sort of the simplest non-curved case you could hope for. You take V3 of P47. That one we know. We take V47 of P47. We don't really know. There is a conjecture that says exactly what the right answer is. It has been proven in special cases. When n is 1, rational curves are at regularity 2. We know what goes on there. Low d, we sort of know d equals 2, d equals 3, we know. But in general, there is a conjecture, but it has not yet been proven. Okay. So this is all I want to say for today about the relationship between the embedding and the arithmetic of the homogeneous coordinate ring. What I would like to spend the last half hour talking about is the question of whether, rather than looking at sort of an arithmetic or an algebraic object to carry this information, How about geometric objects that carry
embedding information. So what we're going to talk about are very, very old, mostly to fix notation. And let sigma i, this is what we looked at right at the beginning. We're going to take the set of linear spaces spanned by i plus 1 distinct points. And take that set and just close it. Let's make this risky closure. the I secant variety. I would like to point out, and this is a, an ad for one of my talks later on in the week, um, that this is a terrible definition. This is the standard definition. It's an okay definition. It's a definition you can make whatever you want. But it's terrible. You're looking at linear space is spanned by I plus one distinct points. That's okay, right? If you take a general set of I plus one distinct points that spans a PI, that's okay, but then you've got infinitely many of these. We don't like to do this, right? Take an infinite union. Infinite unions are not so well behaved. Just to make sure it's a variety, we, after taking this infinite union, we just take this risky closure. <laughs> <laughs> that way we know it's a variety. But neither of those processes are very helpful. Take an infinite union, take this risky closure, and hope for the best. Right? How in the world do you get from X to the secant variety? We are, I mean, in principle, you could be losing a lot of information by doing this. Maybe you always get PN. Right? You take this union and then close it, maybe you always get the whole space. I mean, you don't. The definition works, but it's not a good definition. So, I will supply what I think is a much better definition on. Friday, I think. <laughs> Every my first talk, a much better definition. And I'll prove it's better because just by changing the definition, we learn so much about the secant variety that you're not going to get out of this picture. Unfortunately, the definition is not as simple as this. The advantage of this definition is this is easy. Um, it doesn't involve Hilbert schemes. But, you know, there's always a trade. Anyway. So here's this sigma i. This is the i sigma variety. This is so difficult to understand that this is a difficult problem. What is the dimension of this space? Well, we've sort of computed it twice already. So what is your guess for the dimension? Twice plus one. It's not a curve anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to take i plus 1 points on your variety. So that's the dimension of the variety times i plus 1 plus the pi's that this spans. So here's your guess that it's d times i plus 1 plus i. It is true, though not obvious from the definition. It is true that dimension is always bounded by that. It will be obvious from my definition. We'll see. So, it's true that dimension is always bounded. This does already tell you something. 